Well, friends in Christ, sometimes things happen in life which cause us to do one of those healthy but yet painful things called the gut check. It's very hard sometimes to go through those gut checks, but we have no alternative because something's taken place in our life which challenges us to think about our priorities, our directions, and our choices to make sure we're on the right path with God, the right path with our lives, to make sure that there's nothing getting in the way between us and the big guy upstairs. When I read the gospel this morning, I really kind of hear Jesus telling me to do a gut check, to make sure that I'm really following his counsel, his guidance, and his will for my benefit, not because he's trying to be hard about things, but he's saying these things because he loves us and wants us to live in accordance with his will, which gives God's creatures true happiness. Jesus has this gut check moment come shortly after he visits with an individual. You heard it in the gospel last week, who comes to Jesus and says, teacher, teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. Apparently, the guy thought he was getting the short end of the stick on the inheritance and thought that out of anybody in the world, his brother would at least listen to Jesus. So he asked for Jesus to intervene and for Jesus to solve this family dispute. And if you know the story, Jesus denies involvement. He wants nothing to do with it. Who makes me arbitrator over you? And he tells them the story of the rich man who builds up a whole bunch of things in barns and says, what am I going to do now? I'm going to just sit back and be merry and live. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the story, he's shown to be a fool because he dies before he could spend any of his savings accounts. Jesus tells us in that parable that a man's life is not defined by his possessions and his, his property and income. So when we look at this gospel reading today and we hear a lot of do not stuff, Jesus is asking us to sit back, dig deep inside of ourselves, and ask us, where or in what do we truly find our identity? He says, don't find your identity in possessions and income. So we need to listen to that statement and say, Lord, I hope that I don't find my identity in possessions and income. I hope that I don't portray the idea that people identify me as, oh yeah, he's the guy that's got that fancy car. Oh yeah, he's the guy that's got that big house down on Brown Street. Or that he's that guy that we know has that big fat checking account. Help me, O oh Lord, not to find identity in my possessions. But how hard it is for us in a world of materialism not to do that. I mean, commercialization and everything we hear from TV, radio, and social media, it seems like materialism makes the person. Jesus says, do not get caught up with that. And he tells us that we should not necessarily worry about all these material possessions to the point that we become overly anxious and concerned, that our focus is not on them so much, therefore, that it takes our focus off Christ and focus off God. Martin Luther illustrates and shares with us what does it mean, thou shalt have no other gods? In his meaning, he says we should fear, love, and here's the key word, trust in God above all things. In other words, we need to trust in God for our retirement. We need to trust in God for our health. We need to trust in God to take care of us. We don't need to trust our IRAs, our key old plans, and all other things, which if we begin to trust in them over and above God, we violate the first commandment. We trust in them more than in God. And one way to know whether or not we're trusting wrongfully is to know, ask yourself this question, another gut check for you. How anxious are you? How anxious are you about your future? How anxious are you about your children's safety? How anxious are you about those things that you know you can't control? How anxious are you? 
When you are feeling anxiety, you're violating the first commandment. It's all right to have concern. Yes, God has given us capabilities. He's given us a mind. He's given us skills to express our concern, share our love with other people, and see how can we help you, or what can we do to assure that the person is safe. But beyond that, we've got to turn it over. I mean, let's be honest. We're not God. We can't control everything. Only God can. And that's where we got to learn the difference. Yeah, it's been a problem ever since the Garden of Eden, right? That Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. And have we ever stopped that desire of wanting to have his power, his control? And when we're experiencing anxiety and worry in life, it is visible that we struggle trusting God. I mean, our country is on edge, isn't it? I mean, what happened in El Paso happened at Dayton. I mean, look what happened after a few days at New York. How edge are we when you hear that people at Times Square started running for their lives when a motorcycle backfired? <laughs> yes, our country lives on edge. We're a country full of anxious people because of history and mistrust and the goodness of humanity. It's hard to turn everything over to God, isn't it? But Jesus says, you know, when you get to that point, when you can actually do that, when you can pray for your child's safety in that first car drive outside of Waxahachie, and turn it over to God, you're learning to turn things to God of over those things you cannot control. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives us some great news here in this reading as well to empower us to do these things. One of the first things he does is he illustrates the care of ravens. I mean, ravens don't have savings accounts. They don't have pension plans. They don't have retirement accounts, do they? Do you find them worrying and anxious about their food or their future? No. And Jesus says, if God takes care of little things like the birds, don't you think he's going to take care of you who are understood to be the crown of creation? And then he illustrates with the lilies, right? The lilies, nobody can make a flower as good as God can. Even Solomon and all his money could not be arrayed as beautiful as the lily. If God takes care of these flowers and these pieces of grass who are alive today but tomorrow thrown into the oven, why are you worried? Aren't you, more, aren't you worth more than birds and flowers and grass? But the one thing that really gives me peace with God is not just looking at the flowers, not just looking at the birds, but looking at the cross. The cross of Christ. Jesus has taken care of our biggest problem. We are so easily tempted to believe that the biggest problem in our world is death. That's not true. The biggest problem in our world is condemnation. That's the biggest problem. And thank God Jesus Christ has taken care of that biggest problem through his death and resurrection on the cross of Calvary. So when I'm worried and I'm anxious about things in the future, guess where I go? I go back right to that cross. I say, you know what? God's taking care of what I truly need. He'll take care of the rest of me. St. Paul kind of tells us this same truth in Romans chapter 8. When he encouraged the people at Rome with the following words, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Not just some, not just part. All things. The cross tells you God gives you all things. And Jesus says the same in the gospel this morning when he says to you, Fear not, little children, for the Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. We've got everything we need for eternal life. Everything. Nothing is lacking. 
And so with these wonderful words and actions of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are empowered to deal with that anxiety and concern. I remember one teachable moment I had with my family back in 9-11. Everyone's familiar with the date. Everyone's kind of familiar with what took place that day. When the country was paralyzed by the loss of life with the Twin Towers, and me and I, excuse me, and my family were watching replays on the television, the question was asked, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I said something I hate doing. I said something I don't like doing. I told my friend that we're getting in the car, we're going to the mall. I never liked going to the mall, but I thought we had to. So we got in the car, went to the mall, and that strip, US 30 on Maryville, which usually takes us 15 minutes to drive one mile, that day only took us 30 seconds. The whole place was a ghost town. That mall where you could never find a place to park next to a front door had tons of parking places to a number of points of entry. But the statement was made. I was going to teach the family we're not going to live in fear. We're not going to be anxious about this. Look at the cross. Christ has taken care of everything. And we move on knowing we can trust him to take care of our safety to his will and to his accordance. And then we hear in this text one more thing, one more thing that hits us hard. It's us right in between the eyes. When Jesus looks at us, or maybe he doesn't, and he says this, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And I'm sure that when you hear that, you're turning over. Are you, are you talking to me? Are, are you sure? Sell your possessions? Then what will I have? What will I have to live on? Are you talking to me, Jesus? Are we watching this conversation? Or is Jesus directing this conversation at us? This is where knowledge of Greek language helps in this text. So I looked at this word when Jesus told his audience to sell his possessions. What was he really communicating? The word possessions here communicates sell your being. In other words, he goes back to the top that if you find your identity in those things that are healthy, if you find those th identity in those things that separate you between you and God, you need to sell them. You need to sell everything that gets in the way between your relationship with your father. Sell it and give it to the poor. He's not calling you to sell out and empty your bank account. But he's calling you to sell out on those things that stand in the way. The author of Hebrews really kind of illustrates this more clearly when he writes to his audience the following words. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance that the race that is set before us. Sell those things that entangle you so that you can run more freely in your walk with Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ empowers us, enables us to do the commands of our Lord and Savior Christ in this gospel reading today because we just can simply look at the cross and know, hey, if that's in the way between me and God, I can get rid of it. Whatever it may be, because I know I've got everything. I've got everything I need for eternal life. Fear not, little flock. Fear not. For the Father has gladly chosen to give you his kingdom. In his name, amen.